Good evening, I'm Lee Chui Lin and first up on the show today I'll be having a conversation with Yasmin Mojahid of Al Maghrib about mental health and the role that faith can play in supporting that and then after that as always it is Name That Tune we're going to play you a little snippet like so and then you give us the name of the song and artist but you have to wait for your cue to call to win the world famous Belgian BFM goodie bag and uh, speaking of numbers you can of course talk back all day call us at double seven double three two nine hundred, WhatsApp 018-789-8899 and tweet us at BFM Radio all this is coming your way on the evening edition It is 5.06 in the evening and today on Popit Popit Life, we're looking at how a person's religion and faith might factor into their lived experiences around mental health. So we've been through the numbers. A 2015 survey revealed that 4.2 Malaysians are living with mental health problems and awareness is increasing. Um, a couple of months ago, the health ministry launched a campaign called Let's Talk Malaysia to remove the stigma of those seeking professional help for mental problems like depression, anxiety and stress. So we wanted to explore how these conversations around mental health are happening or perhaps starting to happen within certain pockets and communities. And one area of particular interest we were thinking anyway is the religious community, since this is where many people turn to for comfort and counsel. So we sent our interns, Shamin and Melina, out to get a feel of how people felt about reaching out to their religious community for mental health concerns. And here's what they got. No, I have not. Frankly, I never really trust in this kind of thing because I feel that you need professional help. Yeah, because basically mentally and spiritually from religious community, by the books of the, that they use, the, the teachings that they have. Their answer is no, because I haven't asked about it. Not really. Uh, because I'm in the 80s, I rely a lot on self-help books and being in the right environment. No, I've been to a therapist or I talk to family or my spouse. I don't really have have a religious community. However, for me, specifically with Buddhism, I think there is a sort of help in terms of some of the practices like meditation and stuff like that that does come from Buddhism that are helpful for some mental health. So we want to hear from you as well. I mean, tell us when you are... When you think that you're struggling with your mental health or in general when you're wanting to bolster your mental health, um, where do you turn to for help? Um, and does religion and faith factor into that? Call us at double seven double three two nine hundred, WhatsApp 018-789-8899 and tweet us at BFM Radio. And of course, joining us today as well for this discussion is Yasmin Mojahid. Uh, she has a background in psychology and journalism. She's now an international speaker and author who focuses most of her work on spiritual and personal development. Yasmin's actually in town to conduct a few seminars with Al Maghrib. Uh, Yasmin, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So, um, like we said, mental illness is is a growing issue and it's uh, one that also has growing awareness here in the country, yet it is an issue that is still often dealt with, I think, in in private and in isolation and something that people still continue to not like to speak about. From your observations, is there addic additional stigma or apathy surrounding mental health within religious spaces? I think there definitely still is. And I think a lot of it has to do with a, a lack of understanding. Uh, one, one thing that I really try to teach in my seminars and, and, and also write about is, is this concept of, of balance and of seeing the human being holistically. I think one of the mistakes we make is we see um, the, the the individual as either just the biology, you know, there's the, the chemical uh, aspect, there's the biological aspect, um, but but the human being is, is holistic and the human being has uh, both the biological aspect as well as, as a soul. We believe um, that, that the human being has a soul and a heart and a mind and so all of these uh, uh, parts of the human being have to be addressed in, in understanding this issue. And from my perspective um, and what I've observed in terms of how religion and spirituality factor into mental health, I think it really depends on um, one's relationship as well with their own spirituality because it cuts both ways. On the one hand, I've seen people have uh, tremendous amounts of support and really feel like part of the community when, you know, they seek help from people of the faith, when they seek and they gain a lot of strength from that. On the other hand, there are also people who perhaps feel judged or feel stigmatized. Um, how do you, I suppose, negotiate 
that space and the role that religion can play when it comes to mental health? Well, see, I think that and there's a difference between what, what is uh, spoken about in the text and how it's necessarily interpreted. And there's sometimes there's, there's, a, you know, there's a discrepancy between the two. Um, but I think that sometimes, uh, you know, there's definitely a lot of support, um, but maybe not enough in the interpretation of, of how we understand some of the text. Um, but definitely within the text, you know, one thing that, 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 that I emphasize a lot, or I try to emphasize in my work, is that uh, you know we we believe that God created us with emotions for a reason. That emotions are not something to be ashamed of, um, but that we should be able to learn how to manage our emotions rather than rejecting or suppressing emotion. Um, have you had any? Um, what kinds of conversations have you had about that? Because I just think emotions are in and of themselves such an interesting thing mm -hmm. and something that a lot of people don't like to talk about or when used in a public context, often negatively. You know, mm -hmm. you, you do tend to hear like, oh, you're, you're being too emotional. And that's a tough one, I think, for anybody to hear. So when you kind of center it in that way, what are the conversations that you've had around it? Exactly. And I think you hit the nail on the head. This, this usage of the word emotional as an insult um, or another one is you're too sensitive. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> These are the types of insults, and usually they're 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 addressing women, right? Um, but but that this is something that we need to step back and realize that um, there is. In fact, this is the way God created us, that God created us with emotions, uh, and that's actually healthy. If you take a person and you remove all emotion, that's very unhealthy. And, and you find that, uh, you know, in psychological research, that one of the most unhealthy states to be in is to be numb, is to feel nothing. So that shouldn't really be a goal. So really, I think, again, it comes to balance. It comes to um Having emotion, embracing emotion, but having uh, an ability to manage emotion. What when it becomes problematic is when you have um, emotion that that takes over. So I guess one way to look at it is that we should we should manage our emotions. Our emotions shouldn't shouldn't manage us. And. Um Something else that we were thinking about in terms of that context between mental health and spirituality is that you have, um, or at least when we when we spoke around the office, this is something that came up where people who are facing mental health issues such as anxiety or depression, they are sometimes told, albeit with the best of intentions, that, you know, just pray more or maybe you're not praying enough. Um, where do you think this kind of reaction stems from and what do you make of it? Well, I, again, and, I, and I'm going to keep coming back to this holistic approach, that prayer is definitely a part just because, um, you know, and the reason why prayer is a part of it is because the human being is not only, uh, you know, neurotransmitters, the, the human being is not only organs, but the human being is also a spirit, a soul, and a heart. And so there is definitely a part to play, uh, that prayer definitely plays a part in, in the, the overall health of a human being, but that doesn't discount the importance of the biological side as well. And so that's why I think it's not a black and white discussion. So I think I think the problem within a lot of communities, whether it's this the religious community or the secular community or the medical uh, community, is that we've sort of turned it into a black and white issue. You know, you're either on one side or the other, and it isn't just just any more than the human being is just one one part. But the human being has the spiritual aspect as well as the biological aspect. Now, with that said, I th I think that. Um in line with what you're talking about in terms of viewing somebody holistically and understanding that nurturing that spirituality, nurturing that faith is important. I do think that sometimes um, part of the reason why people are told, you know, you should pray more um, is perhaps the belief or the hope that it is going to be a simple solution, you know, that because it's one step, I'm just telling you to do one thing. Um, and how then do you start to get people to consider the holistic aspect of it to think, okay, you know, it's not just going to be prayer because I think sometimes that stops people from actually seeking for the help. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Um, again, you know, if somebody comes in with, with, with a heart, with heart disease or diabetes, um, it's, it's important to pray, but then there's also other actions that are that would be necessary. And and even you know, it, Islamically, we're told that we're supposed to uh, take the means. It's called um, you know taking action. For example, going to the doctor when you're sick. That that's actually part of our worship. And so that's a very very important element. Uh, you know, holistically is, is to look at that that there is both aspects, and and one doesn't negate the other. Um, but I think it is very very important that we don't take one extreme uh, versus the other. 
I'm speaking today with Yasmin Mujahid, who is um, an international speaker and author who focuses a lot of her work on spiritual and personal development. If and we're talking today specifically about mental health and how it can relate to um, religion, spirituality, and faith. If you have any questions or thoughts, you can send them through. Call us at double seven double three two nine hundred. WhatsApp zero one eight seven eight nine double eight double nine, and tweet us at BFM Radio. Better finance management. BFM 89.9. It's 5.17 in the evening and um, you are listening to me, Lee Chui Lin, and I'm speaking today with Yasmin Mujahid, who is an international speaker and author focusing a lot of uh, a lot on spiritual and personal development. Um, Yasmin is actually in town to conduct a couple of seminars. You'll be hearing more about that later. But right now we're focusing on the issue of mental health, which is something that's been coming up time and time again. Uh, we've been focusing on it today with a particular look, I suppose, through the lens of how faith and spirituality can kind of play a role in that. And we do have a message here from Rahima who says, mental illness cannot be cured entirely either with religion or medicine. What we can do is be understanding towards those who are facing this illness. And um, Yasmin, I was curious to know whether you think, earlier we were talking about that a certain level of stigma that is still attached to this. Do you think there is a growing amount of understanding um, with, from the context of spirituality when it comes to people who do have mental health issues? I, I definitely think we're moving in the right direction. Yes, there's still a, a, a lot of work to be done, um, but we are starting to become more aware, especially you know, in the United States, we have a, a, a big movement in terms of education in, in that field. So I think we're definitely moving in the right direction. Is there a generational aspect to this at all? Because I do do you think there are different levels of understanding about this? Mm -hmm, definitely. I think there is, uh, you know, sometimes uh, the older generation or kind of the traditional approach to things is a little bit different. Uh, again, I think it just, it comes down to really understanding what, even if you go back and you look at the spiritual text, when you go back and you look at the religious text, you find, you know, I'll give you one example, and this is something I share in my seminars, is when you look at, for example, the spiritual, the, 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 the story of some of the prophets that we see in the text when you see, uh, for example, the story of, of the father of, of Yusuf, uh, of Prophet Yusuf, uh, and, and the fact that we're told in the Quran that he says, I complain of my sadness to God. Um, we, we, we're told in, in, in that in, in the his story that he cried until he lost his vision. That these are things that, you know, some, it, it, nowadays it's like we, we say things like, well, you should never feel sadness, right? If you have faith, you won't feel sadness. But the, but we're told that a prophet, uh, who's, who's in fact also told, we're also told that same prophet had, uh, sabrun jamil, which means a beautiful patience. And so we see that if you actually go back to the, the text, you see that there isn't, that same type of stigma that we've created. Right. And, you know, that's the other thing. Um, what role does the religious community play in tandem with mental health? Because I, I think very often um, the first stop when you when you are facing something like depression is you are going to be speaking either to your family uh, or to the people that you trust most immediately within your community and then onwards to seeking help, hopefully. So in terms of trying to work that out together, with the holistic setting that we've been talking about, how do they go together? Well, I think, and, and that's why you have to have to have to have an understanding of of what people need. Uh, one mistake we make is thinking that a religious leader can um, can do everything. And of course, a religious leader has his own or her own um, field of expertise. And so I think it's very important for religious leaders to be able to understand when their own expertise, you know, where the limit is to their own understanding and when you need to refer people to professionals. You know, for example, you know, if you have problem in your marriage, uh, you know, a lot of people will go to the imam or to go to the religious leader, which is fine. But, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a place where you need to go to professionals in, in, in some cases and it's the same thing with mental health issues that, that I think the role of the of the of the religious circle is to realize when a, a specific individual actually does need to go to a professional. Um, while you bring up the example of marriage, I, th I think that's a very important one because, and this is not something that's exclusive to Islam, I think in many religions, you know, divorce is seen as something that is um, just not not an avenue, not necessarily a desired avenue or even an an uh, accepted avenue to go down. So 
how then does that, how can that balance be struck between understanding maybe what might be best for yourself, what you can accept spiritually in terms of situations like that, like your marriage breaking down? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a very interesting topic too. And, 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 um, I might shock you when I tell you that if you, again, if you go back and you take away the cultural baggage and you actually look at the text, you'll be very surprised at what is said about divorce. And it's quite different than what we expect. With And I'm talking specifically about the Quran, about, about Islam. Um, we, the, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about divorce in, for example, um, in Surah Al-Baqarah, in, in, in one of the, the longest chapter of the Quran, um, it's spoken about in a, in a very neutral sense. And, and and it's it's you know la junah alayhim. This is a, a a phrase that means there's no blame on them if they decide to take that you know in talking about that route. So I think even in that context, there is a lot of uh, cultural baggage attached to the topic of divorce. You know, uh, within within Islam, if you actually go back to the text, uh, it's a, it's a very different type of discussion. That that sometimes that's a route uh, that 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 people have to take, and, and and in some cases, it's the preferred route. We're talking today about. Um mental health and the role that religion and faith can play in it. If you have any questions for Yasmin, do call us, double seven double three two nine hundred. You can also WhatsApp 18 and tweet us at BFM Radio. So, um, as I mentioned, you're here to conduct a few seminars um, and one of them is going to be about living a filtered life. Uh, the notion that everything we do gets edited and displayed on social media. And while we're talking about mental health, we know that uh, mental health and social media are pretty inextricably tied. Mm. What have been some of the major struggles you've seen um, that people are facing with this rise of social media? That's a very, very important topic. And I think it's you know, it's an entire discussion in and of itself. Um, yes, I will be teaching that class. Um, it's actually this Saturday. Um, and the reason why why I was very passionate about this class is that there's a lot of, there's a huge body of research in psychology right now coming out showing the link, as you mentioned, between mental health issues and, and social media. Uh, and, and just among that, those, those results and among that, that research has found that the more that people uh, feel the need and, and, and the more that people use social media in, in sort of a, an unhealthy way, uh, the more that they actually have depression and anxiety. Uh, and they're seeing that there's this link between uh, social media use and actually, ironically, loneliness. You know, we think that social media, we think that it's actually connecting us, but what they're finding is that people feel more disconnected uh, and more lonely and more, and more um, dissatisfied, I think, with themselves and with their own lives, the more that they they um, sort of focus and, 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 and become very uh, attached and obsessed with comparing uh, with, with others on social media. So considering that you're going to be doing a whole class on this, maybe my next question is unfair because <laughs> I'm going to ask <laughs> you to leap ahead in that. Um, but what would your advice be to people who do want to participate in social media, who don't want to abstain uh, because it's just, it's part of, you know, mm-hmm. modern day, everyday fabric, but also feel conflicted about it and yes. don't want necessarily to have those effects? Exactly. Well, I mean, I, I think that's, again, a great question. I, I myself am I have social media, I'm involved on social media, but what I've learned over my own journey, um, I joined Facebook back when Facebook was like the beginning, <laughs> at the beginning, <laughs> um, you know, where it was only for college students at that time. I was in, I was doing my master's, um, but, but basically what I have learned over time, my own social media usage and, and observing uh, those around me, reading the research, is that, it, again, it has to be a balanced approach. That there can be very, there's a lot of good that comes out of social media. It's it's a lot like, um, you know, the internet, for example. There's a lot of good, but then there's also a lot of bad, right? A lot, yes, on both <laughs> so, sides. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's there's so much good that's come out of, 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 of the invention of the internet. Uh, you know, so much uh, learning and development, connection, uh, that can happen, but then there's also the bad. And so it's really a matter of managing it. Um, and of course, I will, in, in my course, I will talk more specifically about what are some of the practical tools for managing that, both in order to have, um, you know, more well-being, both psychologically as well as spiritually. And to bring it back to what we were talking about earlier, I mean, in the context of the work that you've done, the people that you've met, have you seen religion offer comfort to those who have been going through, you know, emotional and mental challenges and struggles? 
Absolutely. I have actually heard and, and experienced and witnessed stories that were remarkable. I'll just give you one quick example. Um, I, it, it's actually, they made a, a documentary uh, recently about it. Uh, and and it, it was a story of a, of a gentleman who I knew uh, more than a decade ago. He was the principal of a school that, that I taught at. And um, what happened is that recently he found out that his son was murdered. His, his son was simply delivering pizzas and while while he was uh, delivering in, in, in this neighborhood, he was he was killed. He was stabbed, and um, the documentary went through the the emotional re- journey of the father and and what he went through. And what was so remarkable about his response is that uh, he was able to not only uh, find acceptance of what had happened, but even forgive the murderer. And that, and he, and he, he, he makes very, very clear that that strength only came from his faith. That 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 he, as a Muslim, he was able to um, to even find it in his heart to forgive the killer of his own son, and and that only came from his belief in God and 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 from his religion. And to, again, bring it back to everything that we've been talking about in the course of the last half hour, I think the the main idea of looking at somebody holistically, looking at somebody from all different aspects of what makes somebody a person, a human, how do we encourage more conversations? How do we encourage more interaction uh, within religious spaces, within spaces where it's it's particularly difficult around mental health how can we get that going well i think we're like i said we're 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 in the right direction you know education it's about um spreading awareness speaking having these conversations uh starting to take away the the stigma that that this isn't this doesn't mean uh that you necessarily have weak faith you know this is a this is one of the myths that if you're feeling sad if you're feeling down it means that you have low iman or low faith um there's that that sort of myth around around the discussion and i'm sure it's it's similar in different in different faith communities but just starting to educate and and, and create awareness to take away that that stigma yes I mean, thank you so much for taking the time today it was uh, my pleasure thank you Yasmin is going to be teaching a few classes this week and we just touched on a couple, but there are more uh, with Alma Grip. You can check out almagrip.my slash Yasmin for all the details. Um, and you've been listening today to the Evening Edition, BFM 89.9.